This week on Writers, Inc. What Robert Frost said, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. Um, you need to like, you know, get to work. It's, you're not you're telling people what you think. You know, there's an act of discovery um, that has to happen, um, which is, I think, happens when you're standing in a harsh glow of the little spotlight, you know, truth. J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and a panel of industry powerhouses as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories, all have tips and secrets. What does it take to consistently top the best seller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out. School's in session. This is Writer's Inc. Hi, it's Christine Daigle. Patrick O'Donnell. J.P. Reinflush. Kevin Tomlinson. And I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writer's Inc. Kevin, you are not in your house. Where are I'm you? I'm not in my house, no. I'm on the road right now. I'm headed for an author's conference in Oklahoma. And I'm currently parked uh, at the Fort Worth Bucky's. Which is, if you've never been to a bucket, it's just like this massive gas station. It's like a hundred, hundred and fifty pumps at this thing. It's massive. Oh, is this one like a truck stop kind of thing too? It's but, not. It, just, I, I guess it might be considered a truck stop because it's also known for its for having like the cleanest bathrooms and because uh, the guy who owns it. It's actually its origins are from my hometown in Brazoria, Texas. So I stop at every Bucky's I can find, but you know these are they get bigger and bigger every time they build one. It's like, well, this one's the size of a small state, and now this one's the size of <laughs> a small country. And I don't know, this one I think is maybe like the third or fourth biggest one in the in the uh, world, biggest gas station in the world. Everything's bigger in Texas, right, Kevin? Everything's bigger in Texas, including the gas stations. Yep, yep, and the gas bills. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I- Questions: how, how long have you been on the road, and, and what kind of road food have you picked so picked up so I, far? Like, is there a box I've been of driving, Oreos next to you? And yeah, I got uh, so no. I've, oh, okay, so I've been on the road for about three three and a half hours now. What I've got, I don't know. No one, I'm gonna make a bunch of noise. These are called Bucky Nuggies. Bucky <laughs> Nuggies. They're, yeah, <laughs> they're Bucky Nuggies, and they're bold and sort of spicy. It says, and they're, they're basically puffed corn with. With uh, spicy seasoning, and I get them every time I stop at Bucky's. So in in the health food section, right? Yes. Yeah, that's definitely health food. Yeah, I mean, I'm already yeah. down. I got like beef jerky. Like you can't do road trips uh, without without just filling yourself full of a bunch of crap. I've already had uh, uh, cookie dough. They had these little cookie dough bites. <laughs> you can get. So like, by the time I get to where I'm going, I'm going to have diabetes is basically what it'll shake Perfect. down to. Perfect. So. I want Bucky Nuggies, though. So I think you need to mail those to all of us. There's that. Yeah. I'll get you that. The, the, the popular one is, is Beaver Nuggets. The beaver Nuggets are caramel. They're, they're like puffed corn with, in, with caramel. Uh, like they're not caramel, made with like beaver? A, kind of like it's, it's not, not beaver. Not meat authentic coffee? beaver. Oh, they they okay. got in a lot of trouble over that. So they <laughs> All right. they had to change the recipe. Harvesting. I'm, I'm, I'm mixing this. I'm mixing this entire conversation before we have to go to an R rating. This uh, is this, this is this Texas. Needs, Welcome needs to, to Texas. Now. God bless all us right. all. J, JP, what is in the news? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Follow that. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, y- U.S. Appeals Court curbs Copyright Office's mandatory deposit policy. What a headline that is. Um, A federal appeals court in Washington, D.C. has ruled in favor of Valancourt Books, stating that the U.S. Copyright Office cannot constitutionally require publishers to deposit physical copies of their books or pay a fine. Uh, So the Copyright Office is currently reviewing this decision, uh, and this ruling could lead to changes in the mandatory deposit requirements affecting not just Valancourt, but publishers at large, thereby influencing the industry's relationship with federal copyright regulations. Wow. Well, I've heard absolutely nothing about this. Anybody else? Mm -mm. I I actually heard about this story yesterday, but what I've never heard about is I didn't realize that you were supposed to send physical copies to anybody. I thought that was just like a Canadian thing. 
It is a Canadian thing. That, yeah. That's only if you get uh, free ISBNs in Canada, right? Right, so right. If you get free ISBNs from the government, then you have to send a physical copy. Hmm. But yeah, I didn't know that either. I didn't know that you had to send physical I, copies in I, I remember the US, you having to do I that. I haven't ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah I like never. years ago, I remember that being a thing, but like I, I thought they stopped it, you know, like at the, the end of the century. <laughs> Jokes on all of us, apparently. <laughs> I, I guess so. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, now that's Fun over. Uh, mental <laughs> mental notes and then copies of all of the books I've copyrighted over the years. Yeah, yeah I I didn't know that either. So that's uh, something. Do I do I do this? Where do, where do they do where this? do they put them? Can you imagine the the storage requirements for fat <laughs> that, that Indiana shredder. Jones warehouse kind of thing? That's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> it's just they yeah. just shred them. Books they just sitting on a shelf yeah. somewhere. A little little I'm burn marks all over them. <laughs> Giant recycle bin. Uh, oh, next up in the news um, was it was kind of like an op-ed piece, but it was opt about Goodreads being terrible for books, but why we can't all quit it. So uh, Goodreads has this dual role and user experience, um, and that article delves into uh, the issues with Goodreads. It's a platform that caters both to readers and authors, and there's been some recent uh, things about Goodreads, including review bombing and content moderation that has impacted a lot of authors and is even caused them to, especially indie authors, to delay their book releases uh, just to help that uh, potential review bombing that happens. Uh, so even with all of that said, the industry still depends on Goodreads. Uh, it remains one of the crucial uh, things for the book industry, uh, especially as traditional book coverage wanes. Uh, so this was uh, one of those pieces. I know we've been talking about Goodreads, but uh, this is an article that recently came out that I thought was worth. I've never even heard of review bombing. Is that like an organized thing? Like a group of people get yeah. together and just yeah. beat up on one particular author? Yeah. 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 Even before yeah. the book is released, they do that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. unlike on Amazon, where those reviews can get pulled, especially when it's not verified, uh, they aren't uh, really pulled from Goodreads. So there isn't like a, a control or a quality control to assure that the person made, leaving the review actually purchased the book. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we've said this before, but my take is always that reviews are for readers and not for authors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was listening to an interview um with Dr. Carrie Spencer Prey, who researches what makes books sell. And uh, there are a handful of factors. And one of them was number of reviews, but not quality of reviews. So it didn't <laughs> matter if you had like one star or five stars. Um, so I actually like kind of took a little bit of, I don't know, it was a little bit of relief. I'm like, we just authors need to stop responding to bad reviews. That's not good. Yeah. Don't do it. Leave it alone. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you, sh you should never respond to a bad review, no. right? Like that, yeah. that never ends well for, for anybody. Uh, it's like, do you take the consensus? Like, do you look at the reviews before you buy a book? Like, I, I know I do. Like, if I get a book bub and I like the description, I'll, you know, I'll click through to, well, most of the cases, Amazon. Um, and I'll look at what, you know, the, the overall rating. Um, you know, if it's like a three star yeah. or something, then a lot of times I pass on it, but uh, I don't really drill down to the individual review level. It's funny enough for me. If a book is in that three star range, I probably won't buy it. But if it's in yeah. a very low star range and I can see the reviews of like single one stars and I disagree, <laughs> then I'll buy the book. Oh, or if I find it funny, whatever their argument is for a one star is something that I absolutely love, I will immediately buy it. So yeah. uh, I think that there's a, a place for those reviews. But I think uh, review into mediocrity is, is definitely not something I ever want my things to be. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah. not. Well, I think it depends. Living. Yeah, if it's an author I like, I, I you know, if I've liked their works before, I may not look at those star ratings so heavily. But I do think Goodreads is still important. That want to read category seems to be a trad pub strategy. I've had uh, quite a few authors about to debut, like, ask me to please put their books on that want to read list. Hmm. So it must do something. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. 
Yeah. I, I know I use it just for, to, to keep track of the stuff that I actually want to read because otherwise I'll see an ad for it and, you know, totally forget about it. And, Same. you know, years will go by and like, oh, yeah, I was supposed to take a look at that one. Um, so I, I use it for that. I mean, it's weird. Like Goodreads kind of came about because, you know, people wanted to leave reviews for, on books, you know, unhampered by things like Amazon. Like they wanted their own little private space to do that. Um, if Goodreads went away, I think they would just find another one. Like there's another site out there called um, Library Thing. Uh, which mm-hmm. is just as honestly, it's it's probably better, you know, like from a mechanical user interface, that sort of thing. It's it's a better website, um, just not quite as popular. But I've got a feeling like if Goodreads went away, like that crowd would probably just migrate over to there, and 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 nothing would really change. Yeah. Last up in the news uh, is something that came from the hot sheet, uh, Jane Friedman, and also I saw an email from Dave Chesson at Kindle Premier, and uh, I more or less compiled all of that. Uh, May 2023, Amazon raised prices on Kindle Unlimited uh, from $9.99 to $11.99 for readers, but we've been seeing uh, consistent KU payout drops. So in July 2023, they dropped about 0.0039 cents per page, uh, even with that global fund raising to its highest. So there are a lot of conversations about, is it worth it now for authors to be in KU uh, is really the big question, or is it now time to consider wide or selling direct? Uh, in putting that into uh, scope or reference, a 240-page book read all the way through on KU uh, back in July of 2022 would have given the author about a dollar uh, in returns, whereas now it would be in the 94 cents. Not a lot, but at the same time, there is a difference. Yeah. yeah. And I saw that both as they came out um, and I did the calculation and my page reads and KU were right the same. 3.95 cents per page this month to yep. be exact. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's just you got to think about going wide or selling direct if you can do it. It's more work. That's the trade off. Right. But um, yeah. it can be hard if you're in a day job. But I think there, that we might be at a point where if we're not there already, if you're not already visible in KU, it might not make as much sense to do the work to get known there as it would to, you know, maybe try other platforms. There are lots of other platforms that uh, are not exclusive or make authors money. It's a tricky thing. I, I hear Joanna Penn talk about it quite a bit. And like, I, I do very well with KU, but I also understand that it's a very limited audience. And, you know, anybody could, you know, Amazon could pull the plug on that at any given time. Um, and, and going wide and doing all like I, I originally started off wide and then I started putting in as many titles as I could in KU. And I've kind of left them there. And I've got traditionally published books that are in KU um, just because I've got, you know, such a decent audience there. You know, like Harper Collins said, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that because we want to take advantage of it. Um, but at the same time, like, I really do see the benefit of going wide. I, I, I keep telling myself I need to explore that. I need to explore direct sales. Um, I just, I need to figure out how to get two more hours of the day in order to, to make all those kind of things happen. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think we should all be looking at that. I mean, it feels like a lot of these individual sites are kind of going away. Um, if you look at the internet itself, like it you know, originally started off with individual websites selling these different things. Um, then the you know sites like Amazon kind of came into play. There was um, snap.com was another one. Um, there was one called My Shop. Keeper, where they basically took all these different you know companies and vendors and they just started creating like a, these giant warehouse type stores of, of on the internet where you could buy stuff and now it feels like we're kind of going in the opposite direction again everything is you know it's just as easily to jump on google type in an author's name and go to their direct sales page and if you could buy the title for less and put more money in the author's pocket i think a lot more people are going to do that so i, I think we all should be looking at it um it, it can't hurt. I mean, the more wide you are, if something goes wrong with one of those those folks on the tire, the the rest of the wheel is intact. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I'm I'm going to be pretty biased when it comes to this this topic of going wide or being in KU. But um, my my philosophy on this has always been that you're you're going to put in all that work you're talking about. That's going to go in either at the front end or the back end, and it's better if you go ahead and kind of pull the pen early on because what happens is you spend all this time and energy building up an audience that's not even Amazon. It's just a a narrow subset of Amazon. And when you go Mm -hmm. wide later, you are literally starting from zero because all those subscribers to KU are not going to translate over to uh, customers on Amazon or any other platform. So it's, it's not a dumb idea. There's great money to be made. I was in KU for a long time. Uh, with with most of my books, uh, it's just that once I decided to go to 
to pull them out and go wide, it's been a, a real slog. And I think if I had been doing it from the beginning, I'd be further along now. Well, I don't think the sky is falling yet. And well, this just reminds wrong. us that you should have a plan B <laughs> and a plan C and maybe a plan D. <laughs> yeah. This episode is brought to you by Autocrit. One of the most value-packed memberships for any author, Autocrit brings you an amazing suite of tools that make it a breeze to plan, write, and edit your books all in one place. Autocrit takes you far above standard grammar checking or cookie cutter guidance. Instead, it's like having an experienced editor in your genre watching over your shoulder to help you deliver great writing that keeps your audience trapped in the story. You can even compare your writing style to more than 100 best-selling authors right down to the word level. So you can see what the best in the business do to keep their storytelling clean, clear, and crisp. Listeners of the Writers Inc. podcast can now take advantage of lifetime membership for one single fee. That's right, no renewal fees. Hi, this is JD Barker. I've used Autocrit for years, and not only has it improved my writing, but it's been a crucial tool with aspiring authors that I've mentored. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just beginning, it'll help you find your weak spots and weed them out. Give it a shot with your latest project. Trust me, your editor will thank you. Head to autocrit.com slash JD to get your lifetime membership. Big thanks to Autocrit for sponsoring the show. And with that, JD, who's up this week? This week, we've got Nicholas Fillmore. He's the author of uh, Smuggler, an award-winning memoir chronicling his experience with an international heroin smuggling ring. Uh, and his latest title is called The Gospel of Satan, uh, which released earlier this year. Here he is, Nicholas Fillmore. Well, hey, Nicholas. How you doing? Hi, Kevin. Fine. Nice, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to our chat, and I, you know, I'm looking. I was looking through your stuff and looking over your website and your your uh, bio and everything. One of the things that popped up uh, that I thought was interesting was um, your connection to Orange is the New Black. Whoa, yeah. what's what's the story there? Well, um, uh, the author Piper Kerman um, was. Uh, basically a courier in a uh, a drug smuggling operation that I was involved in with uh, Cleary Walters, who also has a book out, Out of Orange. Um, And uh, gosh, you know, that's a whole story in itself, how and why uh, got involved in my late twenties and some, you know, you know, fool's errand, um, yeah. or, you know, with uh, Nigerian mafia smuggling drugs from Europe and Africa into Chicago, um, is that's you know is, is well it's a story that I tell in, in my in my first book, Smuggler. Um, yeah, I was going to ask uh, clearly. I mean, <laughs> how could you how could you not mine that for material? What what was it like uh, taking those experiences? And I'm I don't know your history there. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what consequences or other things that may have yeah. come along, but I'm sure you talk about that in Smuggler. Uh, yes. So what was it like taking that, all of that experience and reliving that on the page? Um, it was, uh, it was, there was a great deal of relief involved. One of the, besides wanting to, you know, be a writer and write about experiences, um, you know, and, and maybe in some unconscious fashion, I was ultimately after an experience to write about as much as, um, you know, the facade of travel and danger and all that. Um, yeah. it, was, it was a great uh, relief to write about it. Finally, I, um, I did want to take control of the narrative. There was a you know, a Chicago Tribune article that keeps floating up or kept floating up in the Google rankings. Um, uh, ex, uh, talk, uh, reporting my al, uh, allocution at my sentencing in, in Chicago, and and the and you know the writer was just in, you know been placing all these interpretations on the whole scene, and I, I finally felt like I needed to tell you know my part of the story, not not as self justification, but as a self explanation. Um, yeah. The the book uh, tries um, very hard to uh, inhabit. It, 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 it was also the, the writing was also, um, you know, dredged up a lot of feelings because the, the, the modus operandi was to um, try to inhabit the logic of my actions, the, you know, my, uh, you know, not 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 to uh, uh, excuse myself nor apologize, but simply to try to get into that back into that 
in the mind of that person and what they were thinking and what they what they were doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did you learn about yourself from from that? Oh gosh, um, you know, endless capacity for um, for self justification for for uh, you know yeah. for um, cons- constructing things in, in a way that you know one wants to. Um, you know, finally left with, you know, a lot of, you know, questions, unanswered questions too. I Mm -hmm. I could, you know, that's the the riddle of one's own personality. still left with a question, you know, well, why did I, how, how, you know, um, yeah. uh, Yeah. Along the way, I guess I'll say as a a writerly explanation um, later on, once I, you know, and there was a, there was a, Oh gosh, six and a half year prison bid that uh, that uh, inter between the uh, these adventures and, and 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 then getting out and writing about the book. There were a lot of false starts I made in, in jail writing about it. Tried to write a screenplay, gave it up. Um, uh, it really had a, uh, difficulty trying to um, how to present this. Uh, uh, protagonist who's who's um, you know the, this this um, narrator who's not a sympathetic character. How do I um, you know get the reader to sort of come along for the ride? And um, I finally, uh, when I was out and teaching, I uh, was using Philip Lopate's um, anthology uh, uh, about the uh, on the personal essay. And in his introduction, he talks about the job of the the um, the memoirist is to is to uh, drop past psych uh, past um, oh gosh, psychological defenses towards deeper levels of honesty, um, yeah. identifying uh, in oneself, and then the reader finally a fault that seems to exist safely somewhere else. So that became like the, the method: just tell the truth, you know, just yeah. just tell it, just tell it. Um, yeah. and, and that was sort of a, a breakthrough how uh, how to approach this this work. Seems like it would be just incredibly challenging to put a story like that on paper that that might not necessarily make you look good. Yeah. <laughs> like well, how did you how'd you get past that? Um, you know, shamelessness. You know, uh, uh, you know. Um, I, I guess I've always been quick to um, you know overshare. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and then the danger becomes, um, well, you know, you know, when are when what is how much is too much? Yeah. You know, and, and um, you know, it becomes the thing becomes a real picaresque, a comedy of errors. And, um, you know, from, you know, the backstory all the way through, you know, jail and afterwards, um, it's just, you know, constant foolishness. Yeah. Yeah. That's a uh, yeah, I imagine that's tough. Like what was there some metric you adopted to to decide like this this can go in, but this this is a line too far? You know, yeah, I, I suppose I, there's a number of sort of um you know ideal readers I have, and um it's just simply like imagining, um okay, how, how is is this person gonna respond uh, to this? Is this just you know gratuitous? is is this just um you know uh, you know trying to adapt a a, a reader's point of view um Mm -hmm. try to imagine how they're gonna respond i don't i don't overdo that i mean mostly um when i'm writing uh don't remember who said this but you know uh maybe it's maybe it's a song of myself what's true for me is true for all men um you know ultimately that that uh, belief you know that that the writing has the coherent that the coherence of the self that there's a you know implicit trust um mm-hmm. in what you're doing um so i guess that's my ultimate guide is that uh there's a reason um even if you don't know and which is something i, I want to touch on about that there were you know there are a number of things that came out in the writing of the last book yeah. um that uh surprised me that i didn't realize you know there's unconscious urges that really give um shape to the book that you don't you don't realize when you're writing um, yeah well let's talk about it uh, you, that book is uh the gospel of satan now that's yeah. a uh novella length it's a novella yeah it's um i think it's it's less than a little less than forty thousand. 
Boston. Okay. Um, words. So yeah, novella. Uh, and, and I guess a novella, um, be, you know, beyond the simple uh, word count, because it's just uh, one storyline. There are not re- really lots of sub subplots. It's just, um, uh, you know, uh, Jesus and uh, and Satan come across each other in the ancient Levant and recognize one another and, you know, and go off. Uh, you know, of course, there's a there's a there's a, you know, biblical precedent for that, the temptation of of uh, of, of Christ. But this can this uh, this uh, follows them, you know, uh, the devil's there the whole time. Yeah. Uh, Jesus shoulder, as it were. That's interesting. Like throughout throughout his life or throughout like that that ministry or throughout the ministry, they yeah. for some untold reason they seem to recognize one another and just take up and um and and go off and you know right up through the crucifixion and after, you know, the, the devil's there. Uh the yeah. uh you know the the um they they uh kind of see eye to eye um you know the uh Jesus doesn't particularly want to be crucified, um, nor does he like the way the, you know, this construction placed on his actions ultimately by, um, you know, uh, uh, the Pauline construction, you know, that he's dying to, you know, uh, redeem man's mankind's sins, uh, that he's, that he's accomplishing all these miracles, you know, every, every time he does something, uh, somebody imputes some sort of meaning to it. He brings some wine to a party and yeah. oh, look, he, he changed the water into wine. You know, he falls out of a boat and swims back. He's what, look at Jesus walked on the water that he's, he does, he's, he, he um, takes exception to all that because it's this, this retail, you know, there's no, um, it, it, the devil sim- similarly um, is aggrieved by his ontological dependence on God. Everything he does is turned to God's, you know, advantage. So in a sense, each is, is lacking that, that free will with which we justify human suffering. There is not free will that the, the protagonist in this story in a sense is, is God. And it's yeah. um, Jesus and, and the devil too are trying to, um, trying to just live their own lives ultimately and tell their own story um, without that sort of interference. It, it's, it's kind of hitting a note of um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Have you? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's um, anywhere near what you're. T- <laughs> oh, it, it is. It is. Um, uh, you know, I, um, there are a number of these sort of like picaresque, you know, there's, uh, you know, Bertie and Jeeves, uh, yeah. a little bit of, um, uh, uh, you know, most definitely uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. There's a lot of like back and forth, just, uh, you know, banter between the two. Um, and, 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 you know, I tried to smuggle in the, you know, deeper themes under cover of this sort of silly um, back and forth, which at the same time is, is sort, sort of, you know, there's a logic um, at work. I try to be um, very, uh, you know, well, using formal logic and some of their, their arguments back and yeah. forth. So it's sort of a, are you using it as a, a platform for like a philosophical e- exploration? No, I, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I'll say, you know, <laughs> I think ultimately as, as a, uh, an exploration of how one lives one's own life, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, yeah. uh, the need to sort of articulate one's own you know, philosophy. Um, yeah. It, it, you know, it, it's something that took shape over a long time. I was an altar boy, like way back in the day. And, and you know, I just sort of remember being backstage and, um, you know, it, it, fun being involved in all the mysteries and, you know, swinging the incense and tinkling the bell um, yeah. during the mass and, the, you know, all of the, you know, the, the, you know, the Latin. And it was a lot of fun. But at the same time, uh uh, giving, you know, I remember my catechism teacher, you know, always, always arguing with her, you know, giving her hell. Um, later on, reading Paradise Lost in college and, and sort of um, finding this idea that, you know, all one's actions just play into the lo- some larger plan, finding that just sort of hateful. Um, and then again, in prison, struggling to like, you know, 
adapt my own reasons to my situation. Yeah. 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 Do you feel like that was, um, that played a part then? Like, you know, did you have like a little Satan on your shoulder while you were, while yeah, you were experiencing you know, all that? I, yeah, I had, there were a number of characters um, who I was drawn to, um, you know, uh, sort of dark and light characters. Uh, um, and, you know, one of them was just uh, this fellow um, that he was just unregenerate. He would, you know, he's, you know, keep on doing what you're doing. Don't let them break you. You know, that, that's what they want you to do. Um, you are who you are. You know, you're just, you're, 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 you know, we're all becoming who we are. He was just, he was like, gosh, he was, he was like Milton's uh, Satan. And I was really, you know, drawn to this guy. Um, I wanted to know really what made him tick. Uh, yeah. Rather than, you know, a lot of guys get the foxhole religion in jail and become, you know, and I did like, you know, get with some Buddhist guys and do lots of meditation and um, mm -hmm. avoided getting into the Bible study. Didn't feel like that was authentic. Yeah, I imagine that's, it, it, it's interesting and I, and I, I don't, I don't want to keep continuously loop back to a bad experience for you, but it, it just feels like you had to have taken something from that and put into, you know, not the, the memoir, obviously, but the, the fiction. Yeah. And I, I am curious, like what made you decide, what decided the length, the novella length for that? Um, why as a novella? Yeah. Why, why did you, did you choose to write it as a novella or did it just evolve um, that way? It just evolved that way. Um, I think that I have like that. Um, I have a tendency towards compression and brevity from my days studying poetry with Charlie Simic, who was something of a minimalist. Um, he and Mark Strand and uh, oh, a number of others, uh, just, you know, brief um, poems. You know, Charlie said one time, about what somebody had asked him about minimal minimalism. And he said, well, you know, life is short. And if you get someone's attention, you're not likely to keep it for more than a minute or two. You need to say what you need to say. And, and I just, you know, I think temperamentally, that's how I write. And, um, and the thing really came together with a great deal of speed. I mean, Smuggler, I worked on over 10 or 12 years. Uh, the gospel of Satan really came together in about a year. And I think it's because it was just, you know, as I say, things that I'd been mulling, mulching, uh, you know, since yeah. I was an altar boy, uh, this idea, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the Jesus Christ character has always been very interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and uh, maybe filtered through my own jail experience, um, the time was just right, you know, to write about it. And it really came out in uh, one, um, not one sitting, but one, you know, there was one uh, over the period of a year, you know, writing every night, it came together. And, not, you know, the other things I've written, there have been years long breaks. And this just really uh, came to me, um, uh, not fully formed, but, uh, you know, I was prepared to write about it. Yeah. So you mentioned poetry. So let's let's talk a bit about uh, one of your other upcoming uh, works, yeah. uh, the Gentile. I'm going to try it and say yeah. it right this time. Okay. Uh, the Gentile pleasure of anonymity. Yeah. Which is a very difficult word for me to say for some reason. Yeah. Uh, so tell me a little bit about what's going on with that that book. Um, the title of that. Um, is is a poem uh, uh, I I wrote about um, riding uh, on a bus, uh, you know the, uh, the the marshal's bus. You know, occasionally mm -hmm. you see these things on the highway, and you're like, oh, look at those poor bastards. You know, you see a bus go by with wire mesh over the windows and a bunch of selling guys sitting there, um, and uh, that's the title poem is um, about. Uh, writing from, oh, where I was in, I was in a pretrial lockup in Chicago for a long time, for like four years. And they finally sent me out to the prison camp in uh, upstate New York. Well, it was in Western Pennsylvania, it was a couple, but it was just riding along, you know, looking out the window and, and a sense of um, feeling far from everything and everyone, no one yeah. knows who I am, 
where I am, who I am, what I am. And it was an interesting, almost a cozy feeling. Um, but those, uh, that whole, that whole um, uh, manuscript, it starts with my, uh, in I think 88, 1990, I was in the graduate writing program, poems I wrote with uh, Charlie Simic. Um, and then stuff I wrote afterwards, you know, um, there's just a number of times in my life where I you know, got busy and wrote, um, you know, almost like a full manuscript. So there's probably three or four manuscripts. I'm just trying to compress into one thing and yeah. ultimately, ultimately publish. I mean, I came close in the beginning. There was, I was, you know, finalist for the UMass Juniper Prize, a finalist for the Hudson Prize, finalist for a bunch of prizes, alas, you know, the, the publishing racket is, the poetry publishing racket is you, you uh, submit to lots of first book contests, right? Yeah. You, you know, it's a cost $20, $25, yeah. $30. The, you know, these poor yeah. poets are just trying to get into print. Um, and, and I didn't re haven't really made a serious effort to find any indie, indie publishers. I may just do it myself, um, which okay. is what I did, which is what I did with Smuggler, um, which is what I did with the Gospel of Satan. Uh, yeah. With Smuggler, I found an agent um, who was who had gone to same college, Hobart College, uh, his fellow Keith Corman, whose whose father um, Theron Rains, Rains and Rains, had this miraculous like um, uh, he had he'd repped uh, Forrest Gump, he repped uh, the Deliverance, James Dickey's the Deliverance, he repped. Uh, Oh gosh, this what's the Bruce Willis story? And he's in trapped in a high rise at Christmas time. Oh, Die Hard. Uh, the, the, Die the, Hard. the book yeah, was he, uh, oh, I can't remember the title of the book. Yeah, I didn't I, I didn't it. read the book. I read the you know uh, Dickie yeah. and I didn't read Forrest Gump, but this guy had re you know repped all these writers who had fa fa fabulous success. Yeah. And you know, and that's this kid is repping my book, and we came close. I did a rewrite for um Oh uh, gosh, uh, uh, um, National Geographic books. I I, mm. uh, I um, had a close call with a, um, uh, an indie uh, uh, unnamed press in LA. Um, mm. Alas, nobody published it, and I was like finally burning to put my story out there, you know. And I just self-published it, um, having having published a zine back in the day. I had the Fork Express you know uh yeah. skills to, like do this thing yeah. and did, did my own cover design and and um and pushed it out into the world and i en and i enjoyed that experience with uh you know with the gospel of satan i i i think my i pitched over maybe a hundred um uh uh agents um yeah. nothing you know, nobody responded i think you know maybe because a, a novella is not what people are yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, I, I just I thought that the the pitch was compelling, um, but you know, like nothing. You know, nobody. I didn't get a read, and then and similarly with a bunch of indie um, presses, it didn't really get any kind of read. So I yeah. went ahead and published it myself, and and you know, and I you know, and and uh, I'm trying to learn to to be a better marketer. You know, Sammy uh, is doing a great job. Uh, Samantha Lean. Um, who, you know, con contacted you guys. And um, I wonder why, you know, and when, um, you know, the indie publishers will get the same sort of street cred that indie, indie musicians get, yeah. you know, indie musicians that's oh, that guy's, those guys are too cool to like, you know, sell out and, you know, go to MCA. Yeah, maybe, I mean, but, that may be coming. Uh, I mean, we've got yeah. our rock stars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, this is a long, yeah. What was the question? Um, oh, <laughs> others, we were talking about the poetry manuscript, the poetry, and, yeah. Yeah, so that's just something that, um, you know, it's, it's been years and years and years, and um, I just have a very, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you have a, a your current work is, um, you have a novel as well, right? Sins of Our Fathers, Sins of our which fathers, I yeah. see you have uh, an excerpt on your, um, yes on your website. And so what's the, what's the inspiration behind that? Um, oh gosh. So like, 
to like uh oh gosh to like for, to to uh ask to ask for forgiveness and to extend forgive, forgiveness to mm-hmm. your dad you know it's to yeah. to reconcile with the father um and the fathers and real to realize that they all had their fathers who had their fathers who had their fathers tis a common theme right <laughs> yeah um, yeah uh and you know um in my, my, you know, my dad's read some of it and, and some of it, I'm sure brought a tear to his eye. Other stuff is like, you know, if, if one overshares one's own stuff, it's, it's difficult when you're, you know, yeah. writing about living people and oversharing. When's, uh, so you're working on that now. When is that? Yeah. yeah. When is that coming out? I mean, I, I've, I'm probably 150 pages into that. And, yeah. and, and, and it's, you know, a multi generational you know, family story, um, that, you know, that kind of story. Um, so there's a lot of different strands. Um, and, uh, again, you know, um, probably like a chapter a night. I, I, I think I'm a lot of my writings really episodic. Um, I don't really, I don't always think like a novelist tying these long, you know, themes together. Um, tend to tell lots of sort of distinct stories and then find the common, sort of find the, the, the threads and try to, you know, write the, the in-between pieces. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to have to wrap up, but I, yeah. I uh, wanted to ask you one final question. And when it comes to uh, your craft, the craft of writing, uh, and particularly uh, I want to kind of z- loop back around to memoir, because that's something I think yeah. a lot of authors uh, have thought about, but it, uh, may not necessarily know where to start what what would be your first and best piece of advice for someone looking to write their own memoir yeah. um you know my uh instinct has always been to leap to the heart of incidents not you know fiddle around but uh you know and that's obviously you know uh, uh, that to start with the most dramatic sort of part of the story and to build off of that is a method that works um, you know, has works, you know, time honored, um, to, uh, you know, to, um, to not, you know, to, to not fool oneself. The idea is to, um, you know, the Robert, what Robert Frost said, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for yes. the reader. Um, you need to like, you know, get to work. It's, you're not you're telling people what you think, you know, there's an act of discovery. Um, that has to happen, um, which is, I think, happens when you're, um, you know, putting the standing in a harsh glow of the you know, spotlight, you know, truth. So, th- my first question to everybody is: Have any of you ever been to prison and or jail? I'm looking at you, Patrick. Professional capacity. <laughs> yeah, in what capacity? Uh, I've worked well, in jails and I've yeah. been to prison in a field trip when I was in college. I was taking an intro to criminology class and we went to Wapan Maximum Security Prison in Wisconsin. Yeah. That's where Jeffrey Dahmer got offed. And it was an eye opener. Those cells are freaking small, man. And yeah. the. The guards were so nervous. They were counting us every two or three minutes. We'd have to stop. We were in a single file and there was a head count because they were scared mm-hmm. to death that, you know, something would happen to us. But it was it was great. It was an eye opener. That's for sure. Yeah, that's I, I've I've spent a I haven't been in jail. I haven't been arrested for anything. Knock on wood. Uh, mm-hmm. So far, yes, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I was doing the whole, just started your road. Trip. Yeah, I just started. Give me time. I got to go to Oklahoma. Um, I did a uh, a little training thing to be a private investigator when I was in my twenties, and uh, part of that was spending. Uh, we spent twenty four hours in a cell. Uh, it was just a. a f- it was supposed to be fun, I guess. Uh, it wasn't very fun. Yes. I didn't like it. Uh-uh. It was a horrible experience, and uh, it, if, there, if if scared straight worked on anyone, it worked on me. Uh, that I definitely have done everything I can to stay out of jail <laughs> so far. I, I threw a party once in, in college, and I got drunk and yelled at the cops when they tried to kick everybody out of the apartment. 
<laughs> they, just, they decided the smart move was to put me in the back of the police car and take me to Broward County Jail for the night. So I, I spent the night in a jail cell uh, star, star, staring at a, a, a guy that was coming down or from, from something. I have no idea what it was, but he was just kind of shaking, kind of talking to his shoes for pretty much the entire entire night. Um, then they let me out in the morning, and then I had to go to court like about two months later, and the judge just threw the whole whole thing out. But yeah, that, that was enough for me. Um, I, I did I did spend the night in jail voluntarily about, um, geez, I guess about 15, 20 years ago now. There was a, a prison that they closed down, um, and the town escapes me. It's in Florida. They, they filmed a George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez movie there once um, where he escapes from, from the prison. Um, but they basically wanted to turn it into um, like a haunted prison sort of thing where you could spend the night there, um, and they would document it. So like you could rent it almost like an escape room sort of deal. Yeah. Um, and they, they had me and a couple other people spend the night. They locked us inside this prison for the entire night, um, which, which was fun. Okay. <laughs> Eventful, but, yeah. And only one made it yeah. out. <laughs> only, only one made it out alive. <laughs> so uh, how much of, I think all of us may share, I know I share some personal history whenever I'm, uh, whenever I'm writing, not use. I don't usually call it out, but like, do you guys um, ever share any of your like personal history when it comes to your fiction? I, I try not to. <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> Okay, I, I'm, I'm sure I, I'm sure I have. I'm sure I've grabbed little snippets here and there. Um, you know, I've, I've thrown a lot of people and friends and family and things like that into into books, but not a whole lot of personal experiences. Um, you know, some some stuff like I've jumped out of airplanes before. I've done done that. Um, I spent some time on the uh, at the FBI Academy, um, and I've used that sort of experience in some of the things that I've written. Um, but I, I haven't like lifted a, a story from my my life and dropped it into a book. Yeah. Same. I think you can't help but use your experiences, but I don't know that I've like, it's not like creative nonfiction or something <laughs> when I'm writing, you know, but yeah, um, yeah I think I thought it was interesting. I think he quoted um, Waldo Emerson and said, what's true for you and your private heart is true for me. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, I, I want to hear more, but I, it just got me thinking about like, how do you get the reader to come along for the ride with an unsympathetic character. And he's saying, just tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, yeah. maybe pulling from your history in those instances makes sense. That's, I know. Yeah. Well, you pull from your history in the correct way. You know, yeah. it's like adding and deleting things to make your story more interesting and wanting, you know, these readers to come along, you know, with you. Yeah. And, and I think it's like you said, Christine, it's almost impossible not to. Um, uh, I think it was last year. I had joined this like uh, contest poetry esque thing, and it was my first venture into actually writing something that was explicit, like a, a story I had to tell that was like an emotional wound. And uh, I, I broke apart what they were asking, what they, the theme or the topic was, and I took that personal experience and I, I tried to create like a um, a poetic story out of that, and that was like very taxing <laughs> but conveniently uh that ended up being uh one of the 10 that they selected for the uh show so uh sometimes you have to do the taxing stuff in order to get what you want <laughs> yes you do right so uh nick nick was talking about uh so the, his new book is a novella and i'm actually working on a novella right now for substack um do you guys i mean how do you write novellas? I mean, is this anything you think authors can actually sell? Yeah, I think it's getting a lot easier to, to yeah. sell them um, than, than it used to be. Um, I, I just finished a book with 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 Patterson and like we you know, the normal word count that we shoot for is 80,000 words. And I've never had trouble hitting 80,000 words. And most of the books I turned in are like 110, 110, 120. Um, yeah. This one, I was at like 76,000 and like we were basically done with the story. Um, so we ended up creating a, a little bit of a storyline to, to beef it up a little bit, um, mainly because, you know, obviously that's going to the traditional publishing world. We know that, you know, Hachette's going to want, you know, a certain length on the book. We needed to, to get it there. Um, but, you know, if you jump on Amazon at this point, there are, there are books that are 100 pages, 150 pages, 200 yeah. pages. I don't, I don't think anybody really cares at, as much, it, you know, as long as the price, you know, fits the, the book that you're buying. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that it makes that much of a difference anymore. Yeah, and I well, think we're seeing it more in traditional well, no, publishing used... too, right? Like I can like count on my hand um, in sci-fi fantasy. There's like Binti and Murderbot and This Is How You Lose the Time War. They're mm -hmm. all novellas and they're all wildly 
popular. And I liked what Nicholas said about minimalism. He's like, you've only got someone's attention for a minute or two. So just say what you need to say. Yeah. So I kind of thought that was a good philosophy. And I wonder as, you know, we were more of a tech society and as interest spans shrink, will novellas be more popular in traditional publishing? I don't know. I think we're seeing that though. I think yeah. we're like, you know, sites like yeah, Wattpad so. and, uh, you know, what is it? The uh, Kindle one, the Vella, Vella. Vella. Kindle oh, Vella. Vel- yeah. not Vellum, not Vellum. Yeah. yeah. Vella. Uh, like novella. No, it's just Vella. Like, yeah, like novella. Yeah. Not right. Vellum. Yeah. That's right. And then, I mean that, you know, people are actually paying, not just paying to read that content, but like paying monthly subscriptions to read this stuff. So I think mm-hmm. there is a market yeah. for this out there. No, it used to be that's what you would give, you know, somebody for an email address. You know, it's like a reader magazine. You, you get a free novella. Uh-huh. And now it's kind of like, well, people's maybe span of attention or whatever is, you know, shortening. And it's like, OK, as long as it's a good book and it's priced right, like what you said, J.D., then, yeah, party on. Well, here's, here's the real question. How how many words is in the middle of I don't think anybody has a clue. What are they? I don't 30, think so. 40, 40, 40, 000, I would say 40,000 words is probably the upper limit of 30, 40. But the, yeah. Yeah. if you were to read like Ian Fleming's books, they were all like 40,000 words, all the James Bond books. All so the Western are those, like 60,000, right? Like, yeah. But right. it's like, yeah, I don't know. There's like novelette and novella. I don't know what the splitting hairs is. I'm not sure that and it, no one does. It matters, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think one other thing that might be playing into this is the the actual production cost too, with inflation going mm-hmm. up. You know, the traditional publishers are realizing mm-hmm. they can publish a forty thousand word book and sell it for the same amount that they would sell an eighty thousand right. word book, um, but the production cost is actually lower to do that, so their profit margin is a little better, making up for that that difference. If they haven't figured yeah. that out yet, I'd, I'd like to think that somebody out there is is looking at it because they should be. Yeah. And yeah. like, as someone who often has to travel between like four and six hours for work every couple of weeks. Uh, Having a story that I can start and finish within that time period is fantastic Uh, because then I don't have to keep coming back to it. Like I can use that commuting space to really uh, feel like I've, I've completed something so I can really see the appeal to shorter fiction. So would you guys, anyone here, uh, would any of you write a memoir? No. No. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> all right that's been this show uh yeah i mean i, I sorted yeah it. hey thanks for joining us <laughs> I, I sorted it with that murder that i, I solved because i wrote that up you know it, <clears throat> memoir style i guess it i don't know if it would be considered a memoir um yeah i i, I still feel like i've got a couple years left in me and like it, writing a memoir just seems very definitive like this is the end like now it's time to sit down and write the the memoir yeah. like, I, I don't know that i'm quite ready to, to pull that trigger yeah. i like how stephen king did it. maybe when i get See, older he, he sort of he sort of cloaked it as a uh, a writer's guide of sorts, but it was really. I mean, if you listen to on writing or read on writing, it really is. It's even labeled as a memoir of the craft. So I I, I might do something right. along those lines before I turn seventy five, and then after seventy five, it's my farewell letter to everybody. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you keep eating Bucky Nuggets. You're not going to get Bye, Kevin. I know, oh, man. It's like going on this like Bucky Nugget fueled journey across the country. Yeah, <laughs> I can't. Oh. <laughs> JP's check. JP's checking out. That's all. I think, That's we're, it. I think we're. I think we're at the end. Yeah, I think we better wrap it up. Somebody's going to end up with some beaver nuggets sooner or later. I'm not going to complain. If you want to send me <laughs> caramel covered, whatever, I'll eat it. Send it over. You'll love them. You guys will love them. <laughs> uh, JD, who's up next week? Uh, next week, we've got Ryan Steck. He's, he's the editor of one of the world's leading thriller blogs. It's called The Real Book Spy. Uh, he's also one hell of an author. His, his latest thriller is called Lethal Range and released earlier this month. Awesome. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersincpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers, Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.